Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending December 10th. This report is going to be mostly about outer space stuff because that was what was going on in the news and that was what was also sent by a lot of my viewers. So this first one comes from NBC News. Close but no cigar SpaceX rocket lifts, lands, and then crashes. Um, it's not really a crash so much as a hard landing and um, I'll just give you an explanation of this. The primary goal of the launch was to send more than 5,000 pounds of cargo, supplies and equipment into up to the International Space Station. And uh, most of you probably, well some of you probably know that Elon Musk is the one, he's the billionaire that's funding this uh, project. And this is his report on Twitter about it. Rocket made it to the drone spaceship, spaceport ship but landed hard. Close, but no cigar this time. Bodes well for the future, though. It also, um, why I call it more of a hard landing than a crash, too, and agree with that, is it did not damage the drone ship at all. Um, this was actually a ship floating on the ocean that was more or less just a, a giant square barge that it was uh, supposed to softly land on. Well, instead of softly landing on, um, it landed hard. This thing is coming in at supersonic speed, so they're having to use whatever leftover fuel and stabilizer fins to try to uh, get this first stage of the rocket ship to land uh, correctly. Musk has said, I'll just read a little bit of the article here, Musk has said making rockets fully reusable could reduce the cost of getting into orbit to 1% of what it is today. That would hasten Musk's dream of creating colonies on Mars and making humanity a multi-planet species. Now just imagine that cargo now costs, in some cases, like $1,000 a pound or so to put stuff up in orbit. If you could get that down to uh, one-tenth or even, like he said, 1% of the cost, I mean, you're talking about something that's even affordable for an average person to put stuff in orbits, let alone companies or anything like that. But here's, here's how the first stage actually is. It's supposed to, and, and it eventually looks like it will happen. The first stage was equipped with fold-out stabilizing fins and landing legs to facilitate the maneuver. The robotic drone ship is a 300-foot long, 170-foot wide landing. The, the, this is the, the ship that it lands on. This is a stabilized ship platform. It's a 170-foot wide landing platform. And it's designed to stabilize itself even in heavy seas, thanks to a set of underwater thrusters. But even before the launch, Musk said the chance of success was only 50-50 at most. What they have been doing with the uh, practice maneuvers to uh, actually successfully pull this off is they have been make, having the first stage of the vehicle land, land softly into the ocean. Now that still means they lose every single one. I mean, then it's pretty much impossible to recover, but what they're doing is they're getting to the point to where they can get a controlled soft landing of the first stage and recover it, which is the biggest uh, and one of the most expensive parts of the ship itself to be able to be, be reused again. So that's the whole point of the thing. Um, the part of actually resupplying the International Space Station, which was the primary part of the mission, went off flawlessly. The Dragon, but that's it's called the craft, it's called the Dragon. The Dragon cargo shipment includes duplicates of 17 student experiments that were on the ill-fated Cygnus. Now they're also, because of the Cygnus, um, having the problems with that, uh, the launch themselves and losing all of the last uh, set of 17 experiments, they're probably going to be shifting over to SpaceX to take up a lot of the slack here. Uh, the gumdrop-shaped capsule also carries experiments that will study the immune systems of fruit flies and wound healing capabilities of flatworms in the space environments. One of the most important payloads is a laser remote sensing experiments that will monitor the worldwide distribution of clouds and aerosols from orbit. The 15 million cloud aerosol transport system, or CATS, is due to be set up on the space station's exterior later this month. So, um, like a lot of other reporters have said too, this is nowhere near a failure and it's actually probably right on track to getting it done. So, I think in no time at all they'll be actually reusing, you know, all the major parts of spacecraft over and over again. So, rockets may be an inexpensive way to send stuff in orbit in the future. So, this next article is from Navy Thomas 8. This is from CNN.com. If your houseplants look thirsty, you could stick your finger in the soil to see if they need water. But if you want to check the whole plant's moisture level, you need something a bit more high-tech. This is, uh, people call it like the lasso. It's one of the biggest antenna systems ever to be deployed in space, almost 20 foot wide. Um, this is from CNN.com. NASA has just the thing, it's called the Soil Moisture Active Passive or SMAP satellite. It's currently scheduled to launch at 6.20 on, uh, a.m. on January 29th from Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. Uh, what this basically does is it uses two different types of instruments. You've got one instrument that gives you a wide field of view, but not a lot of accuracy. And then you've got another instrument that gives you a very narrow field of view, but very detailed accuracy. So 
if you combine those together and then use some computer processing, what you end up doing is you end up having a very nice wide area but enough accuracy to be useful. They're talking about an accuracy level of about six miles or so. Now this won't help an individual farmer in, an, in, in, in his individual field for his soil level moisture, but it will still give a lot of useful information for what's going on. Uh, let's see, I'll read a little bit from the article here. We call it the spinning lasso, said Wendy Edelstein, the SMAP instrument manager, said a NASA press release. The antenna is 19.7 feet, 6 meters in diameter. Engineers at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab had to build it so that it could be squished into a 1 foot by 4 foot space for launch. This map uses two microwave instruments to monitor the top two inches of soil on Earth's surface. Together, the instruments create soil moisture estimates with a resolution of about six miles. So that is what is going on with that. That will be kind of interesting to see. And it does, I'll, I'll, as usual, I'll put the stuff up here in the pictures and things like that and all the lists of the articles down below. But it is going to be a really strange-looking structure, just like a giant lasso. But hopefully it will give us some useful information. This next one is from 1954 Shadow, my friend Bob. Oper Mars Opportunity Suffering Memory Loss. NASA reveals during plan to hack decades old rover and cure the amnesia. This has been going on and on and on. Uh, this is not even the first time this has happened. It's got flash memory in it. So the Opportunity uh, rover right now, they've been sending commands to it and it's been losing a lot of the commands. So what they're going to do is they're going to get a, a process underway to try to block off one of the memory one of the sections of memory so that they can um, keep the thing going and uh, get it cured here. NASA believes that an aging flash memory is causing the bouts of amnesia and the agency now plans to hack the rover software in an attempt to cure it. The problem has been ongoing for the last six months because the flash memory has been overwritten so many times. Kind of the same thing as when you have an SD card or something like that. They have a lifespan of only so much and uh, if they have good correction in them, what they do when they get to a bad error from too much reading and writing, it just blocks it off. But um, eventually even you know, that kind of stuff can only handle so much, I mean, when it gets so old. And to me, it's kind of amazing that it's even lasted 10 years and it's still going and they still uh, will be able to, you know, take care of this problem too and, and keep the Opportunity Rover going. 10 years when it was only scheduled to have a lifespan of 90 days, I'd say we got, a, a, we got our money's worth. Uh, I'll read the last part of it in a process that may take a few weeks. NASA is planning to hack the rover software so that it ignores the broken part of its flash memory. The hack will involve dividing, isolating, and shutting down one of the seven memory banks causing the problem. So anyway, kudos to whoever designed the opportunity. Ten years and going, that's pretty good. But let's go on to the next Mars rover that's coming up. This is from Fox News. NASA's next Mars rover will hunt for signs of past life, so finally they're actually equipping it, although I'll give you my opinion on one of the instruments that is still lacking and has been lacking on all the rovers, how NASA's next rover will hunt for signs of past life. Mars 2020 is what it's called now. It doesn't have an official name, I'm sure, just like Curiosity and Opportunity and all those, it'll, it'll get a name eventually, but this is scheduled for Mars uh, 2020, and that's what, so that's what it's called. It will have improved instruments over Curiosity. The new rover is heavily based on the Curiosity design, and as with its predecessor, it will be able to search for habitable environments. Uh, one of the things they're going to do is they're going to improve the optics a lot. I guess it takes quite a bit of uh, different shots and a, quite a bit of different uh, computer processing power to be able to get 3D images back from Curiosity. They can't just do it all in one take. They have to do a bunch of different, uh, different views and different shots. So I guess what they're going to do is they're going to make the optical system a lot more simplistic so that they can just take uh, one shot or just maybe a few shots and really get good 3D images back, especially because of the fact they're going to need this 3D to uh, locate good areas to be able to dig and stuff like that for searching for signs of life. Uh, let's see, but Mars 2020, but also this is again from the article, but also look directly for evidence of life, something Curiosity was not designed to do. This will make choosing a landing site crucial since it would involve finding a spot where water or volcanic activity was present in the past. These processes provide energy for microbes. It will be a multi-layer, hundreds of people effort to choose the landing site for 2020, said Jim Bell, a planetary science at, scientist at Arizona State University's School of Earth and Space Exploration. Um, they, they do a list in the article, if you bother to read the article, there's seven instruments. Uh, a lot of them are more advanced versions and some are brand new types of instruments compared to what Curiosity is taking on board. But still, what I have a problem with is they still do not end up sending even the simplest little recording device to record audio sound like a microphone or amplifier or something like that. I mean, it would be little or nothing to do it, and they still, with all of the different probes, all of the different landing craft we've ever had on Mars, uh, to my knowledge, we have still never had 
um, one of these rovers that has had anything that can collect sound. To me, that's just, I don't know, I, I still don't understand why. I've, I've even tried to contact NASA and ask for a response and got no response. So, But other than that, you know, we, had, we do have another go for another one at 2020. So anyway, that's about it for this week. Take care, everybody. I will catch you next week.